Well, thank you, Cleveland. <laughs> First, let me thank Chairman Agarwal for that warm introduction. I'd like to thank Ambassador Hodges for, and Dr. Van Blet for honoring me with this invitation and for your leadership and, and service to the nation. I'd also like to thank uh, Daniela and uh, Andrea for your extraordinary support uh, and for welcoming me earlier and each and every one of you who played a part in making this evening possible. And thank you to the distinguished members and guests of this widely needed organization, the Cleveland Committee on Foreign Relations. Now I gotta admit, I've spent a good deal of time over the last few years uh, traveling, uh, listening and learning from people across the country and across the Arctic. So I just wanted to take a second to thank my wife, Lori, Herbert, who's not here with us, but she is uh, with our two children uh, this evening uh, for her unconditional love and support. So I, I come to speak to Cleveland as so many leaders have before. But tonight I speak to you not as a sailor or a statesman or a scholar, but as a citizen, a proud citizen of the United States and a fellow citizen of the Arctic region. I'm honored to have the opportunity to, to do so here at the Union Club and to be invited by this committee, the National Treasury, an organization that has provided this city and this country so much. It, an organization that's inspired a new generation of leaders and thinkers and deepened our connection to humanity and to the world. Right, in 1945, the Council held its first model of the United Nations Conference with high school students and stretched across the banner and across the stage read, Ask a Teacher. So it's only fitting, right, that this institution, founded by teachers and educators nearly a century ago, would bring us all here together on National Teachers Appreciation Day. <laughs> so I want to thank all the teachers, administrators, authors, publishers, historians, all the educators across Cleveland, across our country, and each and every one of you who are in the room today for doing your part, for taking the time to listen and learn from one another and have these important conversations. To keep the citizens of Greater Cleveland and our country informed about America's interests and our responsibility, in America, including in the Arctic. And I've had so many extraordinary teachers from my kindergarten teacher, Ms. Mayor, through my dissertation advisor, Dr. Pritchard. Each of them change makers, each of them leaders. Now I've learned so much from them, but there's one thing that tops the list, and that's courage. Courage to not simply do what's easy or popular, but doing what deep in my heart I know is right. The courage to pursue knowledge without fear of where the truth or reason will lie. And the truth is, our democracy is under attack. And it's here, along the maritime borders of Russia and the United States, where we find a rapidly melting polar ice cap. The shortest maritime trade route linking Asia, Europe, and North America. Nearly one third of the world's untapped hydrocarbons. An increased abundance in distribution of fish and minerals. Increasing tensions between Russia and NATO and the historical rise and influence of China's third ocean strategy. So today, multiple great powers are competing for access and influence. Small states and subnational territories are facing mounting pressures as they take on larger roles in this new era of great power competition. Authoritarian, uh, authoritarian governments are gaining power and sparsely populated rural communities are losing strength. And despite the United States actually being an Arctic nation, most Americans have little to no attachment to the Arctic. And the vacuum America has left in the Arctic since the end of the Cold War is quickly being filled by China, whose interests and values differ dramatically from ours. And while the problem may, may look a little different as you travel around the country, or around the region, country to country, one source remains the same. The systematic failure of American presence, comprehension, and investment 
and the social, political, economic, and military foundations that underpin democracy and regional stability. So we are at an inflection point in the history of the Arctic region and the history of this nation. And right, the biggest truth, the biggest truth of all is in the face of powerful forces that are trying to sow fear and division and lies among us, the truth is that as an Arctic region and as Americans, there is more that unites us than divides us. Facing this truth may be the most courageous thing we can do right now. So the question, therefore, is what type of Arctic region do we want to be? What type of Arctic nation do we want to be? So the United States has a unique role to play as a provider of peace and as an architect of new security arrangements, as an aggressive proponent of economic growth, as a steward of the environment, as an advocate for indigenous peoples, and as a builder and leader to deal, as a builder and leader of coalitions to deal with the problems of a rapidly changing ice free Arctic world. Right? And no other nation can, can play this role. And the cost of abandoning our efforts in this new ocean would be huge. So as we look at the prospects of advancing this vision in the years ahead, a number of challenges and developments strike me as especially critical to America's interest. First, some in Washington and elsewhere believe that promoting democracy abroad isn't a practical foreign policy or perhaps not even, even in America's interest. But for the past seven years, Washington has understood that American security and prosperity at home depends on the health and econ of economies and people abroad. And America is at its best when other countries have the will and ability to achieve their hopes and work alongside us to tackle the world's toughest problems. And this is a system that we built of international institutions and security alliances after World War II. One based on democratic principles, rule of law, free and open seas, and advancing economic openness and political freedom for all. Surely it, it hasn't been perfect, but it sure has brought about a historical era of development, security, and prosperity for the world and for us here at home. But after the Cold War, U.S. policymakers began to, and they started to believe that you know, once the wall fell, Democratic governments would emerge and endure. The growing gaps between rich and poor, the financial crisis, uh, the authoritarianism, uh, the rise of authoritarianism in Russia, China's expanding economic influence and military influence beyond its borders, and the breakdown of border in the Middle East and in North Africa in the last couple decades have challenged this belief. And all of that has shifted America's focus farther away from its northern shores. And while the arc of history no longer seems so obvious, we do know that America's security interest in the Arctic, like any other region around the world, will be shaped largely by whether freedom finds a foothold in nations and territories where democratic forces are being stifled. And the legacy of totalitarianism reminds us that it is the very denial of these freedoms that often leads to conflict between people and nations. The second key development that gains quite a bit of popular uh, attention and media attention is that for the first time since the end of the Cold War, we see an aggressive and assertive Russia on the world stage. One that has concurrently established a greater military presence and capabilities in the Arctic. And Moscow is focused on transforming the Northern Sea Route, tapping into the vast oil and gas deposits, and defending both from state and non-state actors. The third and most significant challenge to U.S. interest in the Arctic comes from China. I believe, contrary to popular belief, that China, it's China, not Russia, that poses the broadest, most complicated, and long-term threat to U.S. interest in the Arctic. Unlike previous aspirants to hegemony, the Chinese Communist Party seeks to impose its absolute authority over the rest of the world, including the Arctic, by making economies less free and less fair, expanding its military capabilities and footprint abroad, and by controlling information 
and stealing data to repress societies and control narratives. And through all instruments of na national power, China seeks to gain access and influence over Arctic neighbors as part of its third ocean strategy to control the Eurasian continent and achieve global dominance. And China's ambition for a global a uh, polar silk road is already underway. Projects in mining and energy to infrastructure and financial products, China's investment towards that of any other nation and is in keeping with that of a great polar power and a great global power. And China appears keen to shape future Arctic governance and is positioning itself to exert influence among Arctic nations who are deciding the future of shipping, fishing, and other important developmental parameters. In the last few years, we, we've seen China become an observer state of the Arctic Council and spearhead the Arctic Circle Assembly, the largest gathering of world leaders on the Arctic. We've seen the Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party, take ownership of rare earth minerals in Greenland and in Canada and unsuccessfully fund, buy, and build airports and seaports in Greenland, including an old U.S. naval base in southern Greenland. We've also seen China build its first domestic icebreaker and polar expedition cruise ship while ramping up production of a new fleet of ice strength and commercial shipping vessels. It's also completed its ninth expedition to the Arctic and increasingly fishes in what would be U.S. waters. Western sanctions have actually driven Russia closer to China in the Arctic. Last year, China began to benefit from its huge energy deal it, it struck with Russia on the Amal Peninsula, where it's increasing LNG shipments via land and sea. So it's certainly conceivable that Chinese assertiveness in Arctic affairs could initiate an adversarial relationship with Russia, but I don't think that's likely over the near term. An equally significant and likely development in the short term is an increasingly interdependent and cooperative China-Russia relationship, both politically, militarily, and economically. And this emerging relationship comes on the heels of the Communist Party's release of its first official party policy, declaring itself more than just a near Arctic state. In the future, we could possibly imagine debt trap lending as seen in the One Belt, One, One Road Initiative linked to badly needed infrastructure. Chinese built and operated ports in Greenland might be predicated on the use of refueling stations for its vessels. Many loans are tied to Chinese state-owned companies, Chinese technologies, and Chinese labor. Of course, not all Chinese investment is bad, but a fair and open, open bidding process is making it harder for local Arctic communities and businesses to compete and grow. And growing Chinese influence in Greenland and in Iceland is a particular area of concern. Despite having no armed forces, Iceland's location makes the small island nation a cornerstone in transatlantic security and a key founding member of NATO. America has real security and growing economic interests in Greenland. Commercial investments, our continuing strategic military presence, new high-level scientific and political interests, to name a few. In fact, Secretary Pompeo will deliver remarks in Greenland's capital of today, encouraging free and transparent investment in Greenland, and reminding the region and the world of China's playbook in the Arctic. Last December, I had the opportunity to spend a week in Milk uh, on the ground listening and learning to leaders in government, industry, and just talking with everyday people. It's true that Greenland, like much of the region, suffers from a significant lack of critical infrastructure of all kinds. It's also true that many in Greenland want independence from the Kingdom of Denmark. It's true that mature government institutions are few and far between, and society faces many ills. Taken together, Greenland is a right target for Chinese investment and influence in the years ahead. Here's what's also true. The people of Greenland are incredibly resilient, resourceful, and actually ready to grow. Incredible people like Edward from uh, Umanak, 
who I met while touring the Greenland National Museum and Archives. Next year, he'll go on and graduate from the University of Greenland, and he'll go on to be a teacher. And I asked Edward why he wanted to be a teacher. And he said, well, because Greenland doesn't have enough of them, and I love children. So I said, okay. But education is a top priority for Greenland, a national priority. Therefore, it should be a top priority for the United States. I believe in the future, whoever holds Greenland will hold the Arctic. I think it is the most important strategic location in the Arctic, and even perhaps the world. China's rise and influence bring, brings us to the broadest systematic challenge that we face in the region. And it's the deconstruction of the system of states that emerged from the Ottawa Declaration and that's been held in place by the Arctic Council over the last couple of decades. America and our Arctic neighbors would make a major error if we underestimated the challenge the Arctic Ocean region poses or overestimated the stability of the current cooperative, cooperative international system of states that the opening Arctic challenges. To this end, promoting long-term expansion of this community to include non-Arctic states from Europe and from Asia is certainly needed, but it's going to be a challenge for Arctic nations because of the massive uncertainties and instabilities left in the wake of Russia's actions in Ukraine and Syria, but also because of China's ability to press territorial maritime claims and extend its Belt and Road Initiative. Arctic nations also face a variety of transnational threats, particularly in environmental degradation, the release of infectious diseases, illegal fishing, and the displacement of people and wildlife. And such demands require collective action, including new international agreements. And the Arctic Council and the three regional agreements in place provide a foundation for that, for that cooperation. And finally, we confront these challenges at a crucial time in America's history when, frankly, trust in government remains at or near historical lows across generation lines. Many Americans are focused on domestic problems and budget constraints will likely tighten given the many competing priorities and challenges we face in the decades ahead. So now, more than ever, our interests, investment, and involvement in the Arctic must be clearly and directly linked to America's values, our ideals, and our needs. And if America intends to fulfill this, its obligation in this new ocean, then we must lead, and, and lead now. And this starts at home. President John F. Kennedy once said, a nation can, no, can be no stronger abroad than she is at home. With America's Arctic interests being challenged within and without, we can no longer separate our domestic agenda from our foreign policy. So from now on, decisions made in Washington on the Arctic should have a ripple effect not only from Alaska, but from the lower 48. And there's no denying that Washington has turned a blind eye to the state of Alaska and to the thousands of indigenous people who walk their native lands. Indigenous people are struggling to survive and thrive. And the window of opportunity for hunting continues to shrink, making food security a daily struggle. There are over 230 towns and villages in Alaska affected by sea level rise, with several forced to relocate. A hefty bill with the federal government and the state of Alaska isn't too keen on uh, picking up. And no matter where you travel across these territories or these villages, there's one challenge that, or there's a few challenges that remain the same. Economic inequalities resulting from immigration, the loss of traditional knowledge, and high rates of substance abuse, suicide, and domestic violence. Finding ways to retain and communicate to younger generations, this unique identity is a common challenge faced by all of them. Many of these groups take a proactive stance in asserting their political rights, while others turn to the international, the international arena when their concerns fall on deaf government ears. 
And make no, make no mistake, these groups have the best chance to succeed when they are given the power to decide for themselves their own destinies. Developing economies of the North are the nexus of growth. They're open for business, and the United States must be present to shape them. So if not us, who? And if not now, when? A couple years ago, I was traveling with my boss at the time, Admiral Pack, who was the special representative for the Arctic. We were in Anchorage, Alaska, and I had a, I had a couple minutes to kill before, a, uh, before our event, so I took a stroll down to the water front. And I ran into a gentleman who was from the Arctic Village. And so this is the most northern, remote village in Alaska. And I said, so what brings you to Alaska? What brings you to Anchorage, so far away from home? And he said, I'm looking for work. You know, it's becoming more hard. It's going to be harder every day to put food on the table and take care of my family. And so towards the end of our conversation, I asked him, so just out of curiosity, has anybody from the administration the federal government been up to visit you in, in your village? So he said no. But we did have a Chinese <coughs> delegation visit not too long ago. They were interested in helping us with some of our subsistence challenges. They were interested in establishing some educational and cultural exchanges. Blew me away. So the indigenous peoples are on the front lines of climate change. And we have a solemn obligation to protect and promote their way of life and ensure that they do have a seat at the table for future art development. So change in national policy really starts at the top. And even today, it should be possible to define our problems and make recommendations with much greater precision than was possible a decade ago. That's why we need a principal level political military review of the Arctic an honest assessment of where we're strong, where we're not, where we might succeed, where we may not. And what flows from this assessment is nothing less than a call for a new American grant strategy that integrates the Arctic, <coughs> and a new national strategy for the Arctic region centered on the rise of American power and balancing Chinese power rather than continuing to, continuing to assist in its ascendancy. The post-Cold War era has also created artificial lines organized around Europe, Asia, and North America. But their convergence in the Arctic merits a rethinking and reorganization of our national security institutions. And as I've suggested before, we need to revitalize the Arctic Executive Steering Committee out of the White House and create permanent senior positions at the White House, at the State Department, and at the Pentagon to develop and implement art of policy and strategy. So this brings me to my last point. The art provides Russia and the United States a real opportunity, a rare opportunity, to reset and normalize relations. Russia and the United States have yet to fully recognize that their economic, security, and geopolitical interests in the Arctic are actually quite closely aligned. So Russia should be the starting point for a renewed Arctic policy. Any policy that attempts to sidestep, marginalize, or contain Russia in the Arctic is, is it's unrealistic, it's harmful, and it would be doomed to fail. Such a position would not only poison our historically cooperative relationship with Russia and the Arctic, but, but also hinder our ability to strengthen cooperation with other Arctic neighbors. So Russia, I believe, will likely represent our single most important bilateral relationship in the region. For the simple fact that we and Russia together share a majority of the natural resources, as well as the Bering Strait, which could very well become the world's most important strategic choke point in the decades ahead. As hard as it is for some of us to adjust to that reality today, we ought to take the long view and welcome it. The key to our relationship with Russia and the Arctic lies in the structural and cultural changes to our security and economic relationships, with both sides becoming more competitive and open to investment and cooperation. So I think we should start by bringing 
together with the heads of government from the region to address some of these regional economic development issues and security issues. Such a summit would promote regional economic development on issues like free trade, oil and gas exploration, fisheries protection, tourism, infrastructure development, but also facilitate discussion on political military issues and territorial integrity, and help create confidence building measures to prevent unintended escalation and conflict in the Arctic. And leading on economic development will ensure that we meet our goals of sustainable and environmentally conscious growth, and that Arctic First Nations are part of that conversation. On the economic front, the United States should launch a bold Arctic policy that connects the economies of North America, Europe, and Asia by way of the Arctic. I believe the United States should embark upon a bold national goal to build a new maritime trade route connect, that connects a web of deep water ports, airports, roads, fiber optic networks, and high speed rails, and repairs the existing pipelines that are, that are in place. This massive and unprecedented undertaking would extend from the Pacific to the heart of Europe by way of the Arctic. It would also stimulate some $4 trillion in investment over the next three decades and draw in countries that account for 70% of the world's energy reserves. So the White House and the State Department should work with our partners inside and outside the region to create an Arctic Development Bank to fund these badly needed infrastructure projects and give Arctic nations some choices when it comes to Arctic investments. On the military front, the United States should modify its military structure and posture to counter the full array of challenges. So the underlying logic of a new military strategy in the Arctic hinges on allied investments and their territorial defenses, matched with four deployed American forces that can be uh, globally reinforced. We should also focus on interoperability with our allies and with potential partners through rotational force deployments and exercises. So if we rebalance our relationships with allies and partners across the Arctic for more equitable burden sharing, if we invest in heavily in multi-mission ice strengthened <coughs> service vessels, unmanned platforms, logistics, communications, if, and if we prepare our people, invest in them, and help them acquire the knowledge and education that they need and deserve, then, and only then, can the United States ensure the Arctic remains an ocean of peace, rather than a new theater of war. And let's not forget the, that the framers of our Constitution firmly believe that a government of, by, and for the people could not endure without intelligence and education, generally diffused among the people. And so the challenges we face require strategic patience and persistence. This is an ambitious agenda, but I believe it's an achievable agenda, especially if we proceed with confidence, we stay true to our core values, and restore the bipartisanship that's been a pillar of strength for American foreign policy for decades past. This is a new frontier, a frontier where the lessons of man mankind over the millennia can be applied to shape the future of the Arctic and the future of humanity. And the Arctic is too important to the country and to the world to repeat the mistakes of our past and to result to old ways of thinking. That's a message worth sending to Washington. But Washington must change their thinking. I think too many in Washington have lost their way. Many in Congress have lost their way. Their will and their sense of historic purpose. And that purpose is to serve people and to serve humanity. Common sense and compromise at every level of government, especially in Washington, is necessary. And it's necessary that we <coughs> choose leaders that understand the urgency of this problem and have a vision and courage to do something about it. Washington won't change unless we bring change to it. So we can be the new generation of leaders that bring new ideas and fresh thinking to Washington. A new generation of leadership that can unite a divided nation and a divided Congress 
or out of common service, the Arctic. New leaders that can create new solutions and new deals to, do, to deal with the new problems and new opportunities that we will inherit from a blue Arctic. So when I think of vision and courage, I think my favorite literary leader of mine comes to mind, Langston Hughes, who wrote his earlier works while living in the third floor attic of his house on East 86th Street here in Cleveland. This is where he came into his own as a writer. He wrote, I have discovered in life that there are ways of getting almost anywhere you want to go, if you really want to go. I believe America can come into its own as an Arctic nation. I believe we can get to the Arctic, we can stay there, we can grow there, and we can succeed there but only if we really want to go. Not by sitting around and waiting for something to happen, not by leaving it to others to do something, but by leading that movement for change ourselves. And if you do that, if you get involved, you hold your leaders accountable, you take a trip to the region, if you pursue your studies or your career in Arctic affairs, you can change some minds and you can be the change you want to see. And if it weren't for the forward thinking and courage of one Secretary Seward, who added the largest chunk of US territory to the United States, America likely wouldn't be an Arctic nation and we likely wouldn't be having this conversation. So the Arctic, like Cleveland, offers America and the world fresh hopes and monumental challenges. Not least of which, perhaps, is that this new ocean might be the most misunderstood and underestimated places in the world. And as I'm reminded this week, the Arctic, like Cleveland, is best understood through conversation. So thank you very much, and I look forward to our conversation.